Today on Anxiety at Work, we talk about conversations. We've all had that moment when we wondered, what did I say to make that person so mad? I'm Chester Elton, and with me is my co-author and dear friend, Adrian Gostick. Well, thanks, Jess. Yeah, we're going to talk today about how we listen, how we interact and talk with others to bring down our anxiety levels and the anxiety levels of those around us. Our guest today is Chuck Wisner, a thinker, coach, and teacher in the areas of organizational strategy, human dynamics, and leadership communication. He has spent 25 years as a consultant and advisor to leaders in companies such as Google, Apple, Tesla, General Motors, and Shell. I've heard of every one of those, uh, Chuck. (laughs) His methods are anchored in years of research and the practical application of the foundations of conversations. He is the author of The Art of Conscious Conversations, Transforming How We Talk, Listen, and Interact. Chuck, we're delighted to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. I like spreading the word. Oh, good, good. Well, we like to to think about this. I don't know if the last time we've chatted about sort of conversations, so this is good for us. And, And I think most of the time in life and work, as you know, we end up talking and listening with others. And that's a, we're a little on autopilot. Um, right. And stress and emotions can trigger conversations to go off, off the rails. And most of us, we kind of lack the tools to improve those conversations. So start us out by talking about what goes wrong with most of us in conversations. Okay, I think, I think at a fundamental level, we are like fish in water. We're like humans in conversation. And so we, we grow, you know, we're born and we grow up in our families and our cultures and we adopt all those patterns of conversations. Some are good, some are bad. So it just, we sort of like just do it without even A, thinking about it and B, I think a big part is we aren't educated about it. We aren't educated about how conversations work, how we can advocate better, how we can listen better, how we can ask questions better. So that's sort of was the, uh, how the book, was birthed because with my clients over the years, they some clients would say, well, geez, this is really going to change how I lead. Or they're going to say, why didn't I learn this in elementary school? So, Yeah, you know, it, it, so what you're saying is you kind of inherit the way you converse with people. Is that, did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. And we inherit it and we adopt these patterns that we we don't even consciously choose. We, we just sort of like get them and then we have them as patterns and they're very comfy. They're like nice warm slippers or nice pajamas because we know them. We know how to do them. We don't have to think about it. It takes no energy. It takes no effort. So to step back and go, well, wait a minute, let's pay attention to them uh, is really it's sometimes not easy work because you got to look at your own <laughs> your own mess, you know. Um, sure. But it, but it's in the end, it's it it you you become much more uh, cognizant of how they work, and so you can navigate tough spots better. So so just to kind of recap, Chester yeah. is probably if I was talking to his mom <laughs> or dad, I would be talking very similar. Same with me. Uh, we we kind of inherit those. That's really fascinating. Yeah. 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 No, listen, and I I totally relate to that. When I'm with my brothers. We have the same cadence. We have the same expressions. We have, the, in, in many cases, people kind of freak out because they'll say, I'm getting Elton in stereo. Like you guys sound <laughs> and act exactly the same. You're, you're clones. Well, okay, so let's go deeper because you do talk about this idea of uh, fundamental conversation types, which yeah. I think this is really interesting. And there's four. Yeah. So do you want to walk us through that and knowing how... How, when we know these conversation types, we can better communicate with people we're talking with? Sure. And, and so the four, um, well, before I do that, I just want to piggyback onto our thing about adopting the how we talk. Because I like to call them patterns for a very particular reason. I call them patterns because I think it takes some of the sting out of it, some of the judgment out of it, some of the self-judgment out of it. Where when we start looking at our conversational patterns, we can look at it with curiosity and go, oh, wow, God, I learned that from my pop. You know, or or I learned that uh, from my high school history teacher or whatever. So the the idea of looking and and labeling them as patterns helps us sort of get a little removed and we go, oh, that's not me. It's a pattern and I can change it. 
So I, I just wanted to plant that seed because it helps. So the four conversations um, are something that I learned through my studies in the ontology of language. And then later, it dawned on me that with all the complexity of language and all the books out there around the different components of language, it's very hard to get a hold of that material. And so I found that the four conversations were a way to organize a lot of complexity and a lot of tools and practices uh, so that it was more manageable and more practical. So the first conversation is storytelling, and we thrive on storytelling. We, stories are a beautiful thing. In fact, we would not be able to exist without them. Our brain has a, there's a part of our brain that just does make stories. You know, it collects these billions of bits of information based on our past, based on our history, based on our experiences, says, oh, here's what's happening, and then we have a story. And they're beautiful things until they aren't. Uh, and I say that because stories serve us really well, but because of this unconscious uh, process that goes on, we, adopt, we also adopt stories that, that are, don't serve us well. Uh, and the, the small example, not small, but a, a quick idea of a sample I have in the book is I grew up being told I wasn't a big enough man because I didn't like to skin the deer in the basement, because I didn't, I cried, and my three sisters cried, but I couldn't cry. And literally, when I started studying language, it was only then that I realized I had a master story that said, you're not a big enough man. And when I was able to bust that story, I walked into the office, you know, the next day, the next week, whatever, I'm, you know, who knows. And I walked in, and the president of the company is there, friend of mine, and I eventually become a partner in this firm, we're having coffee. And I, I look at him and I say I, to myself, I say, oh my God, I'm taller than Bill. And before that time, I never saw myself as, as the six foot man I was, right? So that's just a small example. So every meeting we go into, every family reunion we go into, every Thanksgiving dinner, we all come with our stories, right? They might serve us, they might not serve us, but paying attention to them and bringing them into the light is really helpful. Should we stop in a question in each one or should I go through the others? Well, I'm just kind of curious about, you know, they serve us until they don't. It, that really resonated with me because, you know, I, I have friends where everything's a story. Yeah. And it kind of gets annoying. Yeah. Do you know what I yeah. mean? So, you know, and the, and at the end of this elaborate story, my question is, so was that a yes? <laughs> you know, was that a, did, did you say yes after that 15 minute, you know, yeah. uh, travel story? So I, I love what you're saying there about, you know, it serves us until it doesn't. Right. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of us, you know, and Adrian and I do a lot of public speaking. We, we can get caught in that story trap right. where everything has to be a story. Is that kind of where you're going in that it serves us until it doesn't? Sure. If yeah. It's I mean, the only way we have to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when I say until it doesn't, it's the stories that um, aren't serving us well, like or serving our audience well. Right. And so then we have to then we have to go inside and we have to go. What what let me take this story apart. We have to do a little deconstruction and say, what are stories made of? And they're basically made of two things. They're made of facts and they're made of opinions. Facts, minus the last four years or the last six years, used to be something we could all agree on. And, <laughs> and then opinions are where it gets really messy, right? Because that's where all of our, our prejudices, all of our uh, biases come into play. And then we start, we start holding our opinions and our stories as the truth when, in fact, they're not. So some of those so are obviously formed in childhood that we're carrying forward, those stories right. we're telling ourselves, as well as, as you mentioned, you know, and sort of public life and social stories that, that we hear, that we believe, then we're going to hold on to that no matter if facts may, may counter those. Right, right, right. And sometimes facts are the good, the, the good guy that says, wait a minute, I have a story that I'm not, not a big enough man, but here are the facts. I'm six feet. I weigh 180 pounds. I have a family, a beautiful wife and a family of two sons. I'm making money. I'm going to be a partner in a firm. Wait a minute. Those don't line up with I'm not a big enough man. Right? Right. right. Yeah. 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 But, and so what's the second? Um, so the second so one, it, we so if we, if we work on, and I spend more time on stories because it's, 
fundam it's foundational. Right. Like, right. like if I move into the next conversation, which is collaboration, that's really um, that's really now a bunch of people are coming together, and now there's multiple stories in a room, right? And and there's multiple perspectives. So whether we're talking about a meeting or we're talking about a community uh, meeting or a business meeting or even a family thing, everybody's coming with their stories, and so that's why collaboration is so difficult because we get locked into our stories. So the art of the collaborative conversation is not giving up your story, but be willing to, A, recognize that your story isn't the truth. It's one opinion out of many, many, many thousands of opinions, or maybe just out of the five in the, one out of the five in the room, and not give it up, but, but also not be attached to it so much that in conversation, the analogy I use is like you're holding it, you're you're holding your opinion with a fist, right? And you're you're like, look, it's got to be this way. I, this is what I believe. This is what is right. This is what is true. And if I come to with a fist and you come with a fist, we're now we're now bumping fists and we're just we get nowhere. So to better be in this conversation, we open our hand again. Don't give it up. But we open our hand and we go, here's why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. Here are my concerns. Here are the standards by which I'm making this judgment. There's always power issues. Power, authority and power issues play a big role in the book. Um, and there's always desires. That plays a big role. So the, that conversation is really our ability to get come together, listen, learn from each other, and and magic happens because all of a sudden I can say, oh gosh, Adrian, when you said that, I never thought of it that way. And, and all of a sudden I can, I, if I'm willing, I can be flexible enough and fluid enough to change my thinking, right? Is the hardest part of opening your fist that listening part? Because we get so, like you say, if I've got my story and I'm holding it in my fist, I'm less likely to listen to other people, you know, there's all kinds of work done on, you know, great leaders are, are good listeners and yeah. so on and how yeah. hard it is yeah. for us as leaders to listen because we have an opinion, we have a solution. Is is that the key to the collaboration uh, type of conversation? Yeah, the, 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 the actual, uh, you know, Lord know, we, we, we all know how many thousands of books have been written on listening, right? Um, mirror the other person, repeat back the words, and all those things. But actually, if you don't do your own work, if you aren't aware that uh, uh, of of the uh, the identification you have with a story, you can't. You there's not even room in your brain to listen because you're busy thinking about your next point and how you're going to prove them wrong or how you're going to prove your point is right, right? So it's that's really key. One. Oh, sorry. Please it's finish. really that's, that's really key to open that hand and go here. I'm going to show my hand, and I'm going to and then the two things that happen in this conversation are advocacy and inquiry, and we're not taught well to do either. We're taught to be advocates to win the battle, and we're not taught how to ask those questions. But if I open my hand, then I want to. Also, the other art is how can I ask a really good question so I understand your position better. So I can sincerely say, what are you concerned about? What standards are you using to judge this? You know, uh, and what fears do you have? And that 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 changes the dynamic of a conversation. No, I love that idea too, because you know, Chester and I, like a lot of leaders, uh, you know, we get we get into this trap where people actually pay us to come talk to them, and so they take as our advice, and so we kind of fall. I don't know if you do this, Chester, but I do. Where you kind of think <laughs> everything you say is right. And, uh, <laughs> But a lot it's of leaders. It's not just right. Yeah, it's not just right. It's genius. It's genius. genius. <laughs> Brilliant. It's Brilliant. And, and so I love this collaborative idea. And a lot of, you know, we would we, you know, we counsel a lot of CEOs and other leaders, and they get into that too, where G Bros, brilliant idea. And, and yeah. I remember telling yeah. somebody something a little while ago who who I, you know, didn't work for me, didn't get paid for me. She goes, yeah, I don't believe that. <laughs> and it, yeah, it sort yeah. of startled me for a moment. <laughs> and, and I was rather taken aback. But then I kind of yeah. calmed down and I asked, oh, why is that? And then she gave her thoughtful. Right. And, it, and it did shake me up a little bit. And it was good for me. But, yeah. but I think we get yeah. into this, this habit, right? If, especially for the boss, we're always right. Yeah, yeah. And that, just that simple move where you, you got startled, right? But then you had the presence of mind because of your experience and your wisdom, you know, you had the presence of mind to ask her a question. Let, help me understand 
how you disagree and why you disagree. And in the book, I use power or authority issues, desires, concerns, and standards as a, as a fundamental template of asking good questions. Right. Oh, this is this is really fascinating. So take us to our third conversation. Type. So then, you know, imagine, well, let's take Adrian's example, right? When he asked the question of the, it was the female you said, right? Um, when you asked the question, and then all of a sudden you have new information that you didn't have, right? So when we are in a real good collaborative mutual learning conversation, what happens is we almost slide into a creative conversation which the third one is the creativity, the conversation for uh, it's creative conversation. Um, we slide into that because what happens is as, as we let go, we open our hands, we, we, we're, we're learning from each other, our, there's space in our mind because we aren't so locked down, and ideas bubble up. And in Adrian's case, it might have been that you and the CEO might have said, well, it's not... Adrian's way, and then you hear her, and maybe a third idea, maybe a new idea bubbles up that you didn't think about or she didn't think about. And so, so that's the value of the creative conversation. And, and there's a couple parts to it. One is at an individual level, are we willing to uh, put, down our, put aside our judgments so we really can consider possibilities? Because this conversation is about uncovering possibilities, being open to possibilities, and then the other personal element is really trusting our intuition. Because often our intuition is going to say, hey, try, you know, go that way or go this way. But often because of our stories and because of our defensiveness, we, we can't even hear those voices. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You, you're open. All of a sudden you're open to that creativity. And I, I think that's what's really missing in a lot of conversations, whether it's within your families or within your communities, certainly in the political spectrum, yeah. there aren't very many creative conversations going on. You know, right. I'm right, you're wrong. Right, and, and a lot of people say it's a brainstorming conversation. Well, any brainstorming session you've been in, the first mistake that's made is someone will come up with an idea and the next person says, we did that, we tried that five years ago. Right, Boom. Right. and they shut it down. And the conversation and is shut, shut down. down, right. And, and, and the art is to be open to possibilities, you know, it's like, it reminds me of, I think of quantum physics, because there's all these potential, all this potentiality and all these possibilities, but if we are locked in on a particular answer, right, or a particular direction, we can't see all these other, we can't even hear all these other possibilities, yeah, right. thanks for going to quantum physics because Chester or I would have gone there pretty <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of our go-to, really, really yeah, when yeah. you think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can blame ever everything on quantum watching, physics. <laughs> yeah, ever since we watched the Big Bang Theory on TV, we've oh. been <laughs> taking a deep dive on quantum physics. I love that um, show. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so conversation type number four is okay. So, so now everything we talked about is I think of it on a spiral. So we can get locked into our own story, good or bad. But then if we hold it open, we come up a funnel and we have a collaborative conversation where we're opening things up. And then we have that conversation. And we come to mutual. We come to um, creative conversation. That's wide open, right? What's possible? And then the last conversation is commitment conversations where it collapses back again. Because commitment conversations are where the action is. This is who's going to do what by when. It's sort of like the, it's like business and, well, life. We live on promises, one chain of promises after another. Like if, if you ask me to do the podcast and I agree, right? Voila, we have a podcast, and then it serves you in one way, and it serves me in another. Because we did the podcast, I can say to somebody else, hey, I did a podcast with Chester and Adrian, you know. And so we live in these little promises, right? And interestingly enough, we do that conversation really badly. Because we are addicted to yes, we're addicted to sure. You know, the boss says, hey, can you get me those slide decks for this afternoon for tomorrow's meeting? on a, you know, a flyby request and I'm sitting there at my desk saying, oh yeah, sure boss, no problem. And then I spend four hours doing it, send them to me that night, the next morning to find out it wasn't what they wanted at all, right? Because I just said, sure, they weren't clear about what they wanted. I didn't ask questions about what they wanted. And so we end up with a bad promise, which breaks, which then leads to distrust. So it's a very, 
there's a particular dance that I lay out in the in the book uh, that helps us understand that how this thing gets structured and um, how to just slow it down a little bit. And, you know, if you're going to make a request of someone, be clear. You know, there's ele- there's timing elements. There's what is good look like elements. There's authority elements. There's all these pieces to it, right? But in the end, it, it is about making promises and then fulfilling them because that's how we build trust. So, so what if you're addicted to yes? Just when I just had this conversation. <laughs> Yesterday we were working with a client in Denver, and he says, uh, yeah, I got on this uh, two-hour call with 20 people on a Saturday. I said, well, why'd you do that? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. so counsel yeah. chess, he's, he's a little addicted to yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was, it, it was. It was one of those things where I said, I, all of a sudden I, I'm on this thing, and I go, why would I give up two hours of my Saturday for a, a, a panel that's too long and too many people? And Adrian just started, Adrian's much better at this than, than I am. He says, yeah. don't you look at your calendar? I go, I guess I don't. I just, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a friend of mine that asked me to be on the thing, and I said, well, he's my friend, and he would do it for me, so I'll do it for him. Yeah. And I think you're right. We, we do get addicted to... I want to be the guy that always supports everybody else. And right, if I, right. If I start to say no, um, that's my you know that diminishes my brand. Right, I'm yeah. a helper. That's right. That's that's sort of the social pattern, right? I mean, and again, it's not a, you know don't take it personally. It's, it's you, you didn't even choose that pattern, right? <laughs> but we we it's my, it's my mother's fault. I'm going to go right to my mom. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Look at when someone makes a, how this. This game works, this, this dance with commitment conversations. Someone either makes a request or an offer. That It's as simple as that. Someone says, will you do this for me? Or I can, I can make the decision, make an offer, or I will do this for you. And then we, 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 it falls into the trap of, sure, that sounds good. Of, of course, I can help, right? But that's only one option. No should be part of our vocabulary. Only for self-preservation, only for taking care of ourselves, and sometimes t- taking care of the other person. They're asking something that maybe doesn't need to be done or should be done differently, right? Um, and I, my, one of my teachers, his name was Rafael Echeverria, um, and he, he said, a request without a possible no isn't a request. It's, it's a, a demand. demand, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a yeah. third option that is not rocket science. It's not surprising, but it's called the counteroffer. And that means that, Chester, if you're asked to do something on a Saturday and you take a breath and instead of saying yes, you go, wow, that sounds like a good community of folks that I should would like to talk to. You know, Saturday doesn't work for me. Could we do it Monday morning? That's a counteroffer, Right. And they might come back and say, no, I can't do it Monday, but what about Tuesday? And so we're, we're in a loop there where we're trying to get to yes, but we're, we're doing it in, in a way that satisfies you, the other person, and also more likely creates a good promise. Yeah, yeah, I, I am really liking this counteroffer. Yeah. <laughs> get get the, get them to say no. Right. Then, then you're off the hook, right? <laughs> right. Hey, I, I I made a good offer, and you know it's it's kind of like when when you offer to help somebody move, and then they hire a mover, you get credit for the offer. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you didn't have to help the guy move, <laughs> this is this is genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and it's it's really true in business. Uh, these flyby requests, you know, that someone gives. Um, there's no space there to ask some questions like what, why do you want the deck? Who's it for? How long does it want to be? What's your style? I mean, all those things, if you ask a few questions, you're more likely to, to, um, to come up with a good promise. So I, I'm, 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 I'm inserting this notion of clarifying a request before you even get to yes, no, or counteroffer. So if a request comes your way, ask, well, what's it about? Tell me more. Why, why, do you, why are we doing this? What would be the benefit? You ask some questions so you can better understand what you're saying yes or no or counter-offering. Yeah. Does that make well, sense? It's, it's smart questions, yeah. Hey, by the way, I, by the, I, we had a list of questions for Chuck. I, we've asked two. It's amazing how <laughs> interviewing a guy who's an expert on conversations led to a really great conversation. This has been really fun. How do people learn more about your work, Chuck? Where would you send them? 
Um, so um, my website is chuckwisner.com. Uh, I am on uh, Instagram. I'm sort of promoting the book on Instagram as Chuck underscore Wisner. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Chuck Wisner. Uh, the book is available on Amazon for pre-order, and it's going to be on. It's it's going to be available next next Tuesday, uh, the twenty fifth, something like that. Great. Um, so that's that's. Uh, uh, and I'm writing a bunch of articles that will be. I'll put on my social media and LinkedIn. I just finished an article for the Harvard Business Review. Actually, it was published two days ago, and one for Psychology Today and one for Fast Company. So uh, those articles should be available. So, so Chuck, no, this has been a, such an engaging conversation. And the, the thing that we've done a lot of work, obviously, the podcast on anxiety. How does mastering these, these four types of conversation help lower people's anxiety? And then my follow-up question is, is clearly this is a great tactic in your mm. personal and your family life as well. So if it, we answer those two questions and we'll, we'll wrap it up. But this has been beyond interesting. Yeah. So about anxiety, I think a lot of the root of anxiety is, so I, I in, in my book I again use a spiral that when we can catch ourselves in conversation or catch our emotional reaction our anxiety or our anger or our disappointment I like the visual of a funnel and at the bottom of the funnel is fear and the top of the funnel is love or open compassion right and so when we catch ourselves with a, a, an emotional reaction to ask ourselves, where am I? Am I spinning down? Because if we spin down the funnel, if, if a fear kicks in, we spin down that funnel and we can't even, we can't see straight at all. All we do is feel the fear and get the chemical flush in our body, right? So if we can catch ourselves somewhere and go, whoa, wh I'm, I'm having this anxiety, what's this about? And we can actually ask ourselves a few questions. What am I concerned about? Is my are my desires not aligned with reality? You know, is there a power struggle going on? Just that that moment to just ask yourself a few questions often brings some some worries and things into the light, so you can actually manage them better. Uh, because when we when we're going down down the funnel, it gets pretty dark and foggy down there. And the idea is to to become aware of what's what are what our thinking is behind our emotion so that we can manage it. Most people don't realize that your emotions are a physical manifestation of your thinking. Right? And so if you, if you can get under it, then, you, then, you, then you're having a much more conscious awareness of how your thinking is driving fear or whatever it is. Does that make sense? Absolutely. love that idea of catching ourselves into in the fear funnel. Um, hey, if, if you had a couple of last takeaways for, for the listeners today, a couple of things to take away, one or two things, what would you say, Chuck? Uh, I'd say start with yourself. Um, when you are in a conversation that feels like it's going off the rails or is stressful, you know, calm, get yourself present, you know, ground yourself in your body you know, sit straight and really be willing to say, to be willing to reveal some of your thinking, right? And that takes a little work because we have, we all have to process our, our inner dialogues, what I call our private conversations. But that work is enormously valuable because in the moment then you become more, much more adept at not being hijacked by them, but by using them in a positive way. And the second thing is, I think we have to fall in love with questions. I think we are, we are taught to advocate. We're taught in school, we raise our hand to have the answer. We aren't raising our hands because we have to go to the bathroom. Well, maybe we do that when we have to. But, but we're raising our hand because we have the answer. We don't raise our hand and say, I have a really good question for you. you know. And some teachers might be, a good teacher would be open to that, but a not good teacher would not be open to that. So I'd say we have to fall in love with questions, you know, to better understand each other and to better understand ourselves. Just such good advice. I, I, I love everything you've said, you know, and, and it's so interesting as you start to break it down into the four types that really resonated with me because I, as you mentioned, the first one, the storytelling, it's so easy to get lost in that and that's your right. brand and disregard yeah. the others. And as you start to understand the different ways 
to communicate and, and to protect yourself. I also really appreciated the, the idea there of how you tamp down your anxiety. You start with love. Don't let it funnel down in, in, into fear. Start yeah. with yourself. So some great advice there. Listen, Chuck, this has been delightful. Tell us one more time where people can get your book because they're going to want to have it if they want to have deep and meaningful relationships yeah, yeah. at work, at home, and uh, in their communities. Is that a big yeah. enough endorsement right yeah. there for you, Chuck? <laughs> great. It's online at Amazon. It's online at Barnes & Noble. Um, and it, I'm hoping it'll be in bookstores in a week or so. Um, so have at it. And, you know, uh, it's... it's, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff packed into the book, but it's worth the effort. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It really has been a delight. Thanks. Dan. Thank you both. Okay, Adrian. So 15 questions on the sheet. We got through like two <laughs> because he's such a great conversationalist. Tell me what yeah. some of your main takeaways were. Well, just this whole, I mean, starting with that we are not educated to have conversations. I mean, what a silly thing that in, you know, 18 years of going to school or whatever it is, yeah. by the time you're all said and done, that nobody's given you at least one lesson on here's how you have a conversation. I, I remember a, a business leader that used to do that with his new employees. He'd sit them around the conference table and say, okay, have a conversation with me. Because he knew they were going to be interacting with clients and, and each other. And they had no idea, these young people, how to start a conversation, how to maintain a conversation. So he actually had to teach them this. So what a, what a, first off, that was really powerful. Yeah, and it made sense to me that most of this is inherited. I mean, the way you grow up and the conversations you have at the dinner table or, you know, at school or on the, on the soccer pitch, whatever it might be, it makes sense. And yet it never occurred to me that we would kind of gravitate towards like one of the four that, that would be dominant and how important it is to understand all three. I, I love the commitment you know, the commitment conversation, that clarification and how that tamps down yeah. your anxiety. I know, you know, what, what, what's expected, when it's due, how perfect it, it has to be. And, of course, one of my biggest takeaways is the, uh, the counteroffer. <laughs> I, I love that. I'm yeah. going to live with that for the next 20 years. Well, and on that commitment, I mean, how many people say yes and then just never do yeah. it? Yeah, and it's it's that's really powerful. And deliver kind of backing up. I want to start with that idea of the stories the, yep. that we tell ourselves. You know, in his case, I'm not to, I'm not a big guy. I'm not any. If I was, and and I've seen that too. I mean, just that's one little example. But where people kind of go. Really? I'm 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 tall. You're like six three. Yeah, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> but they they still are small in their minds because of something that's happened. But now that's just one example. But we carry these stories around with us like little bubbles. Right. And yes, I am this way. I am this political party. I am this. I am I am this that or the other. And and but not collaborating. Yeah. How we hold our stories in a fist. I thought that was such a great metaphor. Mm. And to be collaborative, you know, you've got to open your fist. You've got to be open to other people's ideas. My last takeaway that I, I just thought was brilliant is fall in love with questions. Fall know, in love with questions. I know. I, you know, raise your hand and say, teacher, I've got a really good question for you. <laughs> you yeah. know, the preamble. Yeah. And, and be curious. I, I think, you know, we've lost in our personal dialogue, in our public dialogue, that curiosity. Yeah. And, of course, the out outreach of curiosities, lots of questions. So fall in love with questions. It was my big takeaway from today. And I love that idea. And I've seen that where people do that. Where And it's it's so refreshing where you may have a wacky idea and instead of somebody going, they go, huh, tell me more about that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, it's, and you know they're not buying in, yeah. but they, at least they want to listen to you. Yeah. And, and it kind of challenges you as well to, to really present your point in a in a more thoughtful way versus, yeah, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, our guest was Chuck Wisner and really an engaging conversationalist, as, as you would hope. His book is The Art of Conscious Conversations, Transforming How We Talk, Listen, and Interact. I'm going to order my copy. You should order yours, too. And I'm sure it'll be brilliant. Well, we always like to give special thanks to our producer, Brent Klein, who puts this together and edits out all our, our foibles and, and mistakes. And to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find these amazing guests. And of course, to all of you who listen in, we, we love sharing the knowledge of all these wonderful people we meet with you. And if you like the podcast, please share it. You know, um, we've created a virtual online community called thecultureworks.ai. Um, 
And we, that's a place where you can be, you know, safe in talking about anxiety and workplace issues and so on. We really appreciate you giving us our time. Share it. Join our community. Adrian? And we love to speak to audiences around the world, virtually or in person, on the topics of wellness, resilience, culture. So give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about your event. Um, don't forget to pick up our book, Anxiety at Work. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we wish you the best of mental health. Mm-hmm.